I can hear you now. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Legend. Mm. I uh, feel like I know that uh, that room that you're in there now. <laughs> I've seen many a video. <laughs> um, it is, uh, yeah, I, I, I had one stage when my desk was over there, which meant that you look back kind of out of that window there. So that's another kind of setup. But there's one of two different setups people have seen, and this is one of them. I, yeah. I was rereading re the storyboard, and I'm like, you know my life better than I know my life. <laughs> Winning Michael. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? Hey, that's well, that's Craig. Even. That's Craig, just so you know, Michael. Awesome. That's Craig. Hi, Michael. How's your how's your day going anyway? Oh, it's going well. Yeah, it's yeah. kicking along. Um yeah, it's kicking along. Trying to write a trying to write a new book. So oh, cool. that brings with that mostly pain at this stage. Oh yeah. <laughs> it must be tough just like sitting down and just going i've just got to knock knock this out <laughs> yeah and honestly the the surprising success of the coaching habit creates a sort of expectation of i need to write something that is flawless <laughs> minimum, minimum it has to be flawless so i'm like okay so yeah it's just trying to i mean writing a book you just have to write shitty first draft so i'm just in the shitty first draft stage which is a necessary but painful experience. Oh. But at the same time, there's people going, no, we can't wait to read the next book. And I'm like, oh. hey, I'll try and write something. <laughs> no <that> pressure. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you the type of person who thinks better when they write or do you think better when you speak? Do you know what I mean? So like I know a lot of guys are, are writing books now, but it's almost like they, they're doing audio books and they get someone else to type it. You know, uh, yeah, it does. Like Gary V, for instance. Yeah. He just yeah. rants for a bit and somebody transcribes it into a book exactly. for him. Um, <laughs> I work best. Um, step one is actually kind of figuring out what the structure is. You know, what's the arc of the story that I'm trying to tell? Because um, if I don't have that, then I feel like I'm just flailing around a fair bit. Um, once I have an arc, like I think I've got this, the, the way the story builds through the, the book, um, then there's a question of me writing and in the writing, I find out all the gaps where I need to go. I need to figure this out or I need to think about it. So it's, it doesn't quite, I mean, I'm an, I'm a, I'm an extroverted thinker. So I talk on the fly rather than, than not, but that's not how I would create the books. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I strongly believe that you can't be a good writer unless you're a reader. You've got to read, you've got to see how other people write. You've got to try and work yeah. through their styles. Michael, before I completely butcher your uh, double barrel. No, sorry, um, it's, right. it's designed to be butchered. But yeah. <laughs> I can promise you, I've been like saying it so many different ways. <laughs> it's, like, it's totally okay. Bungay Stenya. 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 Okay. Yeah, it's like go yeah. just channel your Australian, just don't move your lips too Stenya. much. Stenya. Don't, don't make Stenya. it exactly Stenya. You got it. Bungay Stenya. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I'll probably say completely wrong in a second. <laughs> well, stuff. Well, good afternoon there, Michael Bungay Stenya. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast today. I am delighted to be here. I strive to be ridiculously human whenever I can. So this is the perfect meeting of minds and hearts and souls. <laughs> Beautiful. Sounds great to me. Sounds great to me. So, um, Michael, we've had, honestly, we've had this chat booked in for, uh, I reckon, six months now. Maybe um, longer, maybe two and a half years. I mean, it's yeah. been a while coming, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> tell me about it. So, so it's an absolute honor and privilege to have you on our show today. And um, we're really, really excited. Um, and Michael, so you, you're recognized as like one of the, you know, you're highly recognized as one of the sort of the best coaches in the world. Um, you've written a Wall Street uh, Journal published book. Um, you, uh, you're the founder of your own business and um, you've lived around the world. And so, you know, uh, we, we just wanted to um, just say how excited and honored we are, like we said, um, and start the podcast off with a good question, which you would absolutely love so <laughs> tell us 
what's on your mind that's awesome well <laughs> i love that you're doing that because uh, as you know you can see the various foreign editions of the coaching habit back there and the first question of the seven in the book is what's on your mind so i see exactly what you're doing there <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's just a joke anyway we just want to say it. <laughs> you don't actually care what's on my mind i like it no we do no, though no, we, we totally do. do no no it's fine <laughs> too late now podcast is over that's it <laughs> Tell me it's not going to be 90 minutes of you asking a question and then telling me you don't care what my answer is. <laughs> I'm joking. It's going to be a long 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic, Michael. So anyway, you have a very eclectic, eclectic mix of accents. Um, and I guess your original one derives from Australia. That's right. Uh, so maybe you can just take us back to growing up in Canberra with sure. your brothers and what was life like for you? Back, back then? Honestly, I had a pretty great uh, life growing up. So my parents were both public servants. They worked for the Australian government. Um, I was born in Melbourne, but at the age of one, moved up to Canberra. And Canberra was, you know, in the, in the 1960s, late 60s, just a, basically a small rural town. I mean, it was growing. Uh, we lived on what was in the outskirts of Canberra. Um, we now live, you know, the house hasn't moved, but now we're considered in a Canberra because Canberra is very much a, a, a suburban city. Um, but it just meant that, uh, and, you know, without wanting to get a little overly nostalgic here, but it was pretty free. You know, you could kick a ball around on the street or in the backyard, go for bike rides. You know, I'd go down with my friends and play cricket and the cricket nets or tennis, hang out. Um, my local primary school, you know, up to when I was 12 or 13 was a hundred meter walk down the road. So that was easy. Uh, then I went to high school and flourished in high school. You know, I'm, I'm the eldest and I've got a degree of competitiveness and responsibility is kind of baked in as part of that. So I did well at high school, took a, took a year out and then went back to, uh, back to university in Canberra. But yeah, I, I loved growing up. You know, I was strong enough for long enough to be able to keep my two brothers slightly bullied and slightly battered and when they got stronger than me i managed to kind of talk them out of beating me up so uh, allowed me to become a good speaker and communicator i think as practice with my brothers trying to persuade them not to beat me up <laughs> that's always my practice <laughs> i actually uh i always said uh, to my older brother that when i'm when i'm older i'll be bigger than you and i'll be stronger than you. i'll finally be able to beat you up and uh, it just never happened. So yeah, it's one of those sad things in life. You know? <laughs> I'm pretty sure both my brothers are stronger than I am now, but now I get to play the, look, I'm an old man. The, the, I've got a back injury, you know, I do what I can. <laughs> so Michael, your dad is actually English. And uh, where did your mom and dad meet? Uh, they met up in the north of Australia in Townsville. My, my parents are uh, actually distantly related. So my dad was what was known as a 10 pound POM, you know, in those days. So <laughs> POM is what Australians call people from England. Mm. Uh, it's semi-affectionate. Um, and in those days when Australia was trying to bring immigrants into the country, um, and uh, particularly from England, because, you know, we're a slightly racist country, so we're like, we want immigrants as long as they're white like us. Um, <laughs> Dad came out in uh, 1965 to do like a two or three year stint as an uh, aeronautical engineer. He specialized in understanding how to build airplanes. And he, his assumption was it would be three years and then he'd head on back to England, but he met my mum. The rest is history. <laughs> I don't really want to think of my parents getting it on too much. But that's, <laughs> that's what I'd like happened. to linger here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you know weirdly enough I repeated that because you know when I uh, finished uh, undergraduate studies in Australia I came to England to do a master's degree and uh, I thought I'd be two or three years and then I would head back to Australia but I met my wife at Oxford she was doing a PhD there and um, so I stayed in England and then we moved from England to Boston Boston to Canada but in a weird way I replicated my dad's journey of leaving just for a couple of years and then never coming back. Mm -hmm. I, can so I can definitely relate to that because I, I actually went almost the other way. I, I went from South Africa to the UK and uh, I was going to be here for one year and it's been 20 now. So 
I, it's like an ongoing family joke. Like my mom's like, so when are you coming home? And I'm always like, oh no, two years time. <laughs> well, you managed to keep your accent. And yeah. I'm sorry about that because we all know how yeah. terrible the South yeah. African yeah. is. So, totally, man. It gets you nowhere in life, I tell you what. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, just, uh, you know, Australians are, are generally quite honest, but I get also quite harsh people and, and kids are also quite honest in general. I'm just wondering if like having a speech impediment ever meant you were bullied as a kid or anything along those yeah. lines? You know, I didn't get really bullied for having a speech impediment, but I did have uh, moments of self-consciousness about how I looked because I have a cleft lip and palate. So, you know, I've got uh, a kind of slightly weird upper lip. I've got a slightly weird nose. It's very kind of typical of what cleft lip kids look like. Um, as, as a bonus, I've got ears that stick out as well. So I'm like, thanks a lot, dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, it, it wasn't so bad. I mean, one of the things that I just got born with, I just been kind of wired in from the start is a pretty robust self-esteem. I've always felt pretty good about myself. And, you know, honestly, when you're a teenager, there's, there's zero people who don't have a degree of self-loathing or not self-loathing exactly, but that sense of who am I and nobody appreciates me and I feel lonely. I don't feel part of the inner crowd. I mean, that's every teenager ever. Mm. And the ones who think they are part of the crowd just don't understand how the whole thing really works. So I had a bit of that as a teenager, but um, you know, mostly um, I, I was fine. And certainly if I was teased, and I probably was, um, it, doesn't really, it doesn't really stick. It hasn't been, hasn't been a wound I've had to carry with me. Yeah, yeah. It was a tough years. I mean, like you say, yeah. it's, there are very few people that uh, felt 100% amazing about uh, their self-confidence. Right. <laughs> you know, Michael, you... Uh, I love to read. ask Gareth about his speech impediment, his South African. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, um, <laughs> you don't need to linger on that. That's fine. <laughs> I've been ripped off my whole life. You know, I'm still, I've got deep wounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't ask about mine, though. So that's good. You know, uh, <laughs> that's mine, right. is, uh, mine is so soft and soothing. Nothing yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael you used to love uh, to read and, and you still do and, and play soccer as well as a youngster um, yep. what books did a young Michael immerse himself in oh that's a really great question you know um, I read pretty eclectically I I was a fast reader from the start and uh, it's just one of the things that I was good at and I like doing so I love that kind of plunge into a great story so you know a Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, man, I remember discovering that when I was 10 or 11 and just going, <laughs> it was amazing. You know, just reading that. And my dad was into kind of thrillers like Alistair MacLean and Lynn Dayton and um, the Jason Bourne series. So I was like, I, I read a bunch of those. Um, but then when I hit high school, you kind of start getting that first introduction into literature, like you know, Jane Austen and Jane Eyre and, and Charles Dickens and the like. And honestly, I like, I like all of it. I like Shakespeare. You know, I was just an eclectic reader kind of as a, as a kid. And I still am. You know, I read uh, a lot of fiction. My master's degree was actually in, in modern literature. My wife not only has a PhD in literature, but has a master's degree in library science, specializing in, in young adult literature. So she's forever reading young adult books, which I read some of, and they, to, the, the best are fantastic. There's like rip roaring plots and great characters. Mm -hmm. You know, I read some science, I read a fair bit of nonfiction and business because that's you know, part of what I need to know is part of my job. Um, I, like, I like reading broadly. Um, yes. It's that ability, I think, uh, you know, often the interesting way forward, the, inno the innovative way forward comes from the ability to connect ideas that may not have been strongly connected before. Mm. So when I get to go, hey, there's that thing over there in science and there's that thing over there in art and there's that thing over here in business. And I wonder how they all blend together and they fit in some way. That, that's an interesting place to be. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I like that connection, definitely. Do you think that they write as well as uh as well as the as well as they did back in the day now these days because there's so many classics aren't there yeah you know there are 
there are amazing writers now, amazing. And um, there is also the, fit, the sense that um, writing in some ways is more accessible. I mean, you know, there's all these stories of people who make their fortune self-publishing on Amazon, particularly in the world of fiction. And, um, you know, you can, you know, uh, uh, Virginia Woolf, so in the, when was that, in the 1800s, you know, she's part of the Bloomsbury set, but she wrote a, a book called A Room of One's Own, which talked about how, how male dominant, dominated writing was and success was really. It's just like, you know, for women to succeed, they need a room of one's own. And in many ways, um, now it's easier than ever to have a room of one's own because there's just this expectation that anybody can write a great book. At the same time, you know, writing is evolving and in a world where Instagram is, is the way lots of people communicate or Facebook or whatever it might be, I do think there's something about the discipline of writing beautifully. It's, it's, it's a, it's, there's less of a foundation of that taught in, in schools. My guess is anyway, I mean, I, I don't have kids, so I don't have, have a direct view on that, but you know, I see, um, stuff that younger people write and I'm like, I think I was writing better than that when I was their age. Yeah. It's interesting because also, I mean, mentioning that people self-publishing and, and this kind of thing, but I also feel like there was like a heyday of, of, of publishing and book writing. Like, I don't think it's as easy to go on a book tour with your publisher and get well, a, you know. I just don't want to do that because that's just a terrible waste of time, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you do not, I think you're foolish to enter the world of publishing to go, here's a great career for me right now. Because yeah. publishing is just really an archaic uh, business model that is still carrying on. And, you know, they, they're clearly people still succeeding because they get enough things like Michelle Obama's new book and they publish that and they make millions of dollars. But, you know, the experience for most authors being published, and I'm particularly talking about business non-fiction authors because that's who I hang out with, it's horrible. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's horrible and we can't really get why publishers do such a poor job at managing and curating and promoting. But it's because they're like, they're stuck in an infrastructure and a way of working that keeps a, a, a pattern playing out, which that honestly goes, you know, the publishing business is dying rather than thriving. Now, mm. self-publishing and this kind of new evolution of publishing is amazing. You know, the Coaching Habit book, which I self-published three years ago, and I mm. did it through, effectively, I hired a company called Page Two Publishing to be my kind of white label publisher. So I got to have all the control I wanted over publishing the book, but I got to have all the expertise that I don't have to actually successfully publish and market and distribute the book. And they just have a really smart model, which is thinking about here's how we are reinventing publishing. Mm. Oh, that yeah. sounds really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so talking about businesses and things like that in careers, you've had many over your life. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering if you ever remember like what your first job was and how long you lasted in that job. Well, you know, if, uh, are you talking about like my first part-time job as a teenager or? Yeah, you yeah. Your, yeah, your first. Oh, yeah. When you were a youngster. So, when I was a youngster, my, my first job was delivering milk. So uh, this was in the days where you actually had a milkman come around and, and deliver <laughs> the milk. And in Australia, the way you did it is you had a, a milk truck go around in the evenings. A guy would drive the truck through the suburban streets and there'd be a couple of guys in the back of the truck who would load up their their trays with the, the orders for the upcoming houses, jump off the truck, run off, deliver three, four or five different houses, come back, load up and carry on. And that's what I did. I did that for three or four years. It was a great job. You know, it um, relied on you being young and fit. <laughs> and those, those days I was young and fit. Um, <laughs> It didn't pay particularly well, but it felt like it was, uh, okay, it's an hour and a half or two hours. It's contained. 
I get a bit of money. I get a drink of milk at the end. Uh, Greg, <laughs> the guy who is my boss, is still my friend. We still see each other when I'm back in Australia. He, we, uh, we actually shared a house with a couple of other guys for three or four years. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was my first job. And you know, from there I went to, I, uh, when I got back from university, I worked through university and I was mostly washing dishes in restaurants. Uh, for that so yeah i love it those jobs are so I cool i need a lot of dishes <laughs> yeah <laughs> those jobs are so important in life though i feel you know like yeah and also even as a youngster they kind of give you a bit of status like i remember as a youngster the guys that used to do the paper rounds yeah. they would like finish school and then they would be the guys like at three o'clock they had to be at in a certain corner because all the papers got thrown there and they had to roll nice. their papers up and go and do yeah. it but they were yeah. the guys that had the extra pocket money and stuff, you know, and it's yeah. crazy. In, like, in my, in my wow. town, the high status job was in the, uh, the gas stations, the petrol stations. Um, <laughs> in the days where, you know, you would go, you drive in and somebody would fill up your tank for you. Yeah. And uh, I tried to get that job. I actually got a job as an overnight petrol station, gas station attendant. At the end of my one shift, um, the books were unbalanced by a factor of about three thousand dollars. So I got fired <laughs> immediately. I never even got paid for that one shift. Oh, um, nice. That Besides three thousand dollars, <laughs> you know, I just pressed a wrong button somewhere. I didn't lose three thousand dollars. I just screwed up his till. But anyway, that's funny. It's, <laughs> it's so funny. The milk, um, the milkman, so to speak, is 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 like there's like a sort of certain amount of romanticism in my mind about that. You know, like. You just needed milk and bread and eggs and, yeah. and your house was sorted. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It, was, it, was, it feels very old fashioned now, but it was a great job. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike, there was a certain balloon incident, uh, which meant you were banned from your high school graduation. Uh, what uh, was that exactly? What was the balloon incident? Yeah. You know, uh, here's the thing. I'm not actually going to tell you what the balloon incident was because <laughs> it actually sounds better when you don't know. So as part of my uh, introduction and the like, I will say, you know, Michael was banned from his high school graduation for the balloon incident. <laughs> and um, people are like, just like you, you're like, well, what, what, what was that? <laughs> what did you do with a balloon there? Or balloons, they got you banned from graduation. And here's why I do it. So when, I, um, when I'm giving a keynote speech and I'm introduced, I'm trying to lessen my status to the, to the group I'm speaking to um, because I'm trying to play a game where I'm trying to have the audience engage with me and be engaged with what I've got to say to them. And I know enough about neuroscience to know that the more I can raise the status, the, the rank of the audience, the more engaged they're going to be. Mm. And one of the best ways to do that is to diminish my own status it's my own rank slightly so that you know when you're the keynote speaker at a conference you've already got all the status you need you are mm. the speaker you get the introduction you get the hoo-ha you're on stage and so in the introduction i'm like so me and michael was banned from his high school graduation for the balloon incident he was sued <laughs> by one of his law school lecturers for a defamation he did this he did that and i'm just trying to go look everybody i've got a bunch of successes that I can point to. I was a Rhodes Scholar, I published some books, I've run a company, I'm extraordinarily good looking, all of that. Mm. But um, <laughs> it's helpful to balance that out with like, yeah, I like, I've had my struggles and I've been, I've had my failures, like we all have. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm basically normal, normal-ish anyway. Uh, I, I really, <laughs> I really like that. That's such a, such a great way to just, yeah, even things out, isn't it? It's brilliant. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm not, the, the, you know, I have the luxury of being a tall, overeducated, white, straight man. So I, I arrive with a lot of status and privilege that I can give away to try and balance the scales out a bit. Not everybody can do that. Like if you're a woman of color, if you're shorter rather than taller, if you're not a living embodiment of patriarchy, woo, um, <laughs> you've, you've got less to play with. So you have to think about how you do that and how you, you connect with your audience. For some people, you want to enhance your status on stage rather than mm. not. But I've got the luxury of being able to play with it and give some of that status away. 
Wow. That's cool. It's really fascinating that you've, you've actually gone down that, you know, every little cue, visual cue, every cue is important, isn't it? And you, even when you have the privileged side of the cue, you, you still cognizant of that. I think I always picture people on the other end of the spectrum, having to work themselves up to that point. But um, bringing yourself down is really smart because it makes you want to feel like a mate and you can in- engage yeah. and be part of the conversation rather than sit back and just observe you giving the talk. And I think it's actually really smart. Yeah, I mean, it speaks to a bigger piece. You know, my company, Box to Crayons, is about uh, in the world of learning and development and training. And, and I do keynote speeches and, and I write books and the like. And it's easy in all of those worlds to focus on content as the thing that matters. It's like everybody gets a bit fetishizing content as, as all, if you get the content right, you've got the thing right. But as soon as you think about that, you know it's wrong because we've all been to a show or an experience where you're like, I didn't love all the content, but I love the experience and I feel really mm-hmm. great about it. And you've equally been to things where you're like, the content was interesting, but man, they killed it by the way they presented it or they talked about it or they... they so for me and everything I do, you're in service to your audience. So how do you reduce your need to show off how smart you are by how much content you have and increase the ability to engage the audience through a certain experience? Mm. Cool. Beautiful. And, you know, just talking about you being really human and the human side of yourself, um, you speak about feeling powerless uh, a number t- uh, of times in your life. Uh, and one of them was an incident in the cadet force where, Oh, yeah. um, two guys in your year were beaten up um, and that created a sort of a sense of suspicion um, in yourself uh, around sort of rules and the system, didn't it? Well, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's, you guys have, I mean, you, <laughs> clearly you've been listening to every podcast I've ever spoken on because you've got some great stuff that I don't normally talk about. But yeah, and in high school, um, I, I just watched a couple of guys who are friends of mine be beaten up not not kind of really badly but enough by the the cadet force and have and and having that endorsed by or not dealt with by the teacher who was leading the the cadet force which is really the shameful thing i thought and i'm not sure if i can put my my i'm not sure that 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 made me become an anarchist who's like down with all rules and down with uh, whatever but um it does for me raise issues about speaking truth to power, uh, understanding when you have power, understanding the responsibility that comes with power. And just also for me connecting to a value I've got somewhere around that, which is around fairness and the importance of what it means to treat people fairly. And that was a deep example of a lack of fairness and, um, an abuse of power and that abuse of power is is particularly what i find disheartening yeah and and so just like off the back of i guess that incident and maybe some others too you want to help people become more rebellious against the system but in a good way like what what do you actually mean by that yeah i i would frame it um as less about rebelling against the system but more about not giving up your own humanity to the system. You know, uh, one of the thinkers and writers that I admire is a guy called Peter Block. Um, he, he, his most, his best selling book is called the um, uh, flawless consulting, but um, his more philosophical books, uh, things like the answer to how is yes. And he says just broadly, he says, look, my job or one way of framing the work that he does is to give people responsibility for their own freedom. And he would say that in most power structures and in particular organizations, which is where he did a lot of work and I do my work, there's just an inherent bias to dehumanize people or make them, I mean, it sounds a bit more dramatic perhaps than than it actually is, but certainly a way of saying you can give up your sense of autonomy. You can, you know, it's pretty easy to have a parent child relationship 
with the organization with whom you work rather than an adult to adult relationship. And you kind of just go, look, best thing for me to do is just head down and just play the system. And for me, it's, um, you know, I, I mean, I run a small company, so I don't really want everybody who works at Box of Crayons to rebel against me and overthrow <laughs> me. That's, that would be a, sl a confusing <laughs> outcome. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I do, I do want them to take responsibility for their lives and how they show up at work and for the choices they make. And what that means is being willing to stand up against the tide if, if need be. Hmm. Yeah. And, and Michael, do you feel like in the modern world that this hierarchical system is becoming less and less in a sort of a, in the current environment amongst yeah. sort of businesses and stuff? Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? It's, um, what do I think about that? I think that, um, You know, we're, we're on the one hand, we're in the so-called gig economy where lots of people are going, I need to put together my, my life by driving an Uber and doing this and doing that. And you could argue that that gives people more autonomy because they get to shape their life. At the same time, you could argue that that actually excludes them from some of the the structures that allow a good middle-class life to happen because it's actually hard to, for instance, if you want to do this, get on the property ladder when you're an Uber driver, because yeah. certainly in Toronto, Toronto is a ridiculously expensive city. And because, you know, because housing has, um, I'm not sure when this happened, but because housing got kind of framed as it's an investment, it's how you make money rather than it's a, a consumable housing prices. Everybody put their money into housing, housing prices rose. It was like, I'm trying to make more money on flipping and selling my house. Now nobody can afford to buy a house. I, mean, I don't know how, it's not even young people. I don't know how anybody really can afford to buy a house in Toronto. The medium price for a house is a million bucks. Wow. I mean, you have to have like 250 grand to, to, to start paying off a 30 year mortgage who has $250,000. I mean, I don't get how that all works. So, um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, like, are we trying to dismantle capitalism here? <laughs> <It's>, that's, <laughs> that's a pretty big ask. Um, mm. it's, I, I, so I don't know how to buck that system, but there is something to say about it's, easier in some ways now there's more permission being given than ever before to be entrepreneurial to start your yeah. own thing it doesn't feel to me that a lot of power and money has moved from the privileged to the non-privileged mm. yeah 100 percent well i'm not even sure what i was saying there <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question no no it is yeah, yeah no like I'm... you know how power and hierarchy work and you know i'm not sure it's changed much i think it's evolved so it feels different but um you know w when we all get these little windows into how power happens and how decisions get made at high levels uh, i don't know about you but i go i have no idea how to access or influence that world yeah, no, that, that's exactly what you, you answered my question. Well, I mean, the, the gig economy was what was on sort of right. on my mind about that. And, and do, does that give you more power in, in some ways or less? And I think it is quite complex. But I mean, like you say, yeah. it's a big, it's a big question. And it, it ties into capitalism and all these yeah. things. So it is an interesting. So, uh, Michael, after studying a law degree in Australia, you headed off to Oxford University um, to study philosophy and modern literature. Um, how was your time at Oxford? Uh, well, well, confusingly, I, I just studied literature there, but weirdly enough, the degree is called a Master's of Philosophy. Ah. That's because when you do a degree at Oxford, if you do a BA at Oxford, a, you know, an undergraduate degree, if you wait five years and then pay 10 pounds, they automatically give you an MA. Ah. So whenever somebody says, I have an MA from Oxford or Cambridge, it just means that they're old and they have an undergraduate degree. It's... I don't know how they get away with that, honestly. I'm like, isn't that a con? <laughs> it sounds <Yeah>. like <laughs> a master's of philosophy is a, a regular course work master's degree. And I did that in modern literature. 
And so how was Oxford? You know, it was uh, brilliant in lots of ways. I, you know, I didn't really want to continue to study. I didn't have any better ideas. And I really wanted to be a Rhodes Scholar and I became a Rhodes Scholar. So, but then I showed up going, it's not like I've got a passion to do a PhD in this or something in that. Um, but I did get to, A, not become a lawyer because that would have been a sad day for everybody, the law system, my fellow <laughs> lawyers and me. None of us would have been happy if I'd been a lawyer. Um, and I got to meet my wife who was studying at Oxford as well, who'd shown up to do a PhD there. So, um, you know, there, that's two pretty big wins from getting over to Oxford. Yeah, so tell me about <laughs> it. Yeah, <laughs> Two like side wins, definitely. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so Michael, just uh, talking a little bit about podcasts. Obviously, we're on a podcast now. You wait. Are... This is a, this is a podcast. Yeah, I know. It's this new. <laughs> I thought thing. we were just chatting. I uh, know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're actually like an original, I guess, podcast. I think you started yours in 2009, uh, called the Great Work Podcast, and yeah. You also have um, the Habit Coach podcast. Yeah, so, the Coaching Habit podcast. The, sorry, right. the Coaching Habit it's podcast. Right. But um, sorry, so why is podcasting a good medium and um, how has it changed over the years? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's changed over the years because now everyone, you know, it's just become a forum for communicating. When I, when I started my thing, I called it the Great Work Interviews because the word podcast wasn't even used then. It's just me going... Hmm. Look, I, I want to talk to interesting people. This is the best way I can think of doing it. And it kind of expands my network because I can call up you know, people who I admire, like Peter Block or Dan Pink or Brené Brown or whoever, and go, do you mind if I interview you? And often they're like, sure, it's delightful. So I was, I was a little bit ahead of the, the curve there. Um, you're right. You know, it's... Um, it's, it's, you know, I've actually put my podcast on hold at the moment because I'm trying to figure out how do I do an interesting podcast? Because the style of podcast that I used to do, which was effectively like a 30 minute interview, oops, um, uh, I just went like there's a bajillion people doing 30 minute interview podcasts. The one mm. guy like me going, tell me about your book. And I was like, it doesn't feel that different or that interesting anymore. What? So I, I don't know how to stand out from the vast sea of podcasts that are out there at the moment. I mean, how, how do you guys make Ridiculously Human stand out or be different from what else is out there? It's a great question. Yeah, it is a good question. I mean, we, we I don't know, we try and hit a different layer you know, that maybe other people are not hitting. I mean, there, there are lots of, I guess, story podcasts out there, like about people's stories. Yeah. But um, we just try and go maybe that little bit of extra layer. We do, and we do more homework than most people. For so sure. therefore yeah. we, we get to ask maybe, you know, slightly different and maybe sometimes better questions. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess our, our name is quite unique. So we get people's ears perking up with it. And yeah, and, yeah it's, the it's, fact that we're South African also plays a role. Like we coming yeah. at it from a slightly, you know, there's a very, it's a very American centric thing still, you know, and, yeah, it's um, true. and so to have a slightly different angle from a, from a little place in the South end of Africa, people are in, a little bit intrigued by that as well. And sure. And we might come at it at a different angle, like Gareth said. So I think there's, you know, there's a few things. But at the end of the day, the struggle is real still. You know, we, how do you stand out in the sea of, of interesting podcasts, actually? Right. But it's like the blogging industry. There were, there's, there were millions of blogs and, and some of them sort of rose to the surface. And, yeah. and I guess if you, it's the showing up and the persistence part of it as well. Yeah. Um, and I think all of those play into the this field that that is called podcasting. You know? I mean, it's interesting. That, I mean, you can see both of you have uh, fancy microphones. I've got my fancy microphone down there. You know, there's, <laughs> there's a bunch of things where there's a, a different level of professionalism that, that happens in terms of sound quality and the like. But then everybody's doing that. Like everybody's got a decent microphone and yep. 
and knows how to do that. So you don't win any prizes for being sound that doesn't suck anymore. Yeah. Um, and you, everybody, do you guys have intro music and outro music? As you, yeah. Yeah, because everybody's yeah. got cool intro music and outro yeah. music. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's different a bit, but same mostly. Um, yeah. And it's really intriguing to figure out, so how do you stand out? Um, or do you need to? Because honestly, uh, a big part of why I did my podcast is, look, if people listen to this, great. But I'm doing it because it's, in, it's nourishing for me and my soul. Mm. Yeah, 100%. that's a big reason why we do it. We like yeah. literally, we literally feel we have changed so much as people yeah. nice. in the last year and a half. Hope you know for the better, and yeah. that's one good enough reason to do it, I guess. For sure. Yeah. And we've we've spoken to you, Michael. You know, and then the, 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 these kind of things actually give us a lot on a very selfish level. Um, obviously, the people that are our wonderful listeners are, you know, they love to hear these stories, but like you said, it's, there's, they, there's they a selfish really component. It, listeners, they don't like you at all. They're just doing this yeah. for them. I think we've got clear on that now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, you got the edit that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's out. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> classic. So, you know, the, the, you've got to hit you with a, one of those classic questions as well though. And, uh, so what are some of your favorite uh, and most influential books and podcasts? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I get influenced different ways by different books. Um, you know, I'm just reading a graphic novel series at the moment called Saga uh, by Brian K. Oh, I forgot what his surname is and, uh, and an illustrator. And I love it. I'm not really graphic. I didn't grow up on graphic novels. I don't, I, you know, I've come to this as a 50 year old dude. So I'm like, I'm pretty late to this, but I love the, the, the imagination and the humanity and the speed and the character development that they somehow in these graphic novels. So, you know, I'm influenced by the, the latest thing I, I read. And then there are some, books that I read, you know, when I was young, when I was 16 or 17, that just had a big impact on how I see the world or think about the world or think about writing and art. So there's an Australian writer called David Maloof who wrote a short novella called An Imaginary Life. And it imagines Ovid's life at the end of Ovid's life. So Ovid is a Roman poet, a love poet, but really best known for his series of poets poems called metamorphoses so it's all about change and it talks about how in the last years of his life he was exiled from rome because he did something scandalous and sent out to the, the very edge of the roman empire you know out in bulgaria or somewhere like that now and um you're know, living with a tribe of of um effectively wild people he had to kind of learn a new language, kind of unlearn Rome and learn nature and just evolve into that. And it was fantastic. And I remember reading that and just going, wow, this is a way that literature is striking me in a brand new way. Um, wow. And then, you know, things like uh, Bill Bryson's book, A Short History of Nearly Everything. You know, when it, when, you know, that's my kind of go-to book to recommend it's bill bryson is best known i think as a travel writer you know his early books are and they're hilarious i mean it's just if you've ever traveled to any of the countries he writes about like england or australia or parts of america it's very funny but a short history of nearly everything he takes on science and he says look science is um, underappreciated by many of us because we ha most of us have this terrible experience in high school where we get taught science and we're like, ah, oh, kill me now. Which is, you know, <laughs> my experience. I mean, I did not, I did not experience the poetry of science in the in my classes. So he just brings to life scientists and moments and discoveries. He's incredibly gifted at coming up with metaphors. So he just has an ability to create a metaphor that explains a scientific purpose and tells a great story. And for me, you know, I'm a atheist, secular, and go, you know, there's all sorts of scientific reasons why we live here and now, but it just made me go, it's, it's basically miraculous that I am here now. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, pretty, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. So that, that's another great book. 
Yeah, tell me about it. Um, did you read his Australia books? Is that interesting? I did, yeah. Yeah, 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 hysterical. Yeah. Yeah, good book. <laughs> I can totally, re- totally relate to the, the science thing. After, after doing two years of science in high school, uh, at the end of one class, my, my teacher, her name was Dr. Fanden Hook, and she, uh, she said, Gareth, um, I just need you to stay after class um, just for a second. And she, she, she gives me my science book and she goes, Gareth, you've, uh, you've been doing science for two years now and um, you've covered your book very nicely, but you've only got one page full in the whole book. Um, you're, you're bringing the class average down. So I suggest that you, that you give science up and you take another subject. And I was like, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so funny. Uh, funny. It's yeah. interesting that you mentioned science books because one of the intro, influential books for me was um, The God Delusion. And not just because of the content of the book, but also because I also, like you mentioned, they actually it triggered something in my mind that it, it's the, the idea that science can be used to explain things well and, and get your right. point across. And yeah. it's kind of like enlightening and I also yeah. kind of saw science in a different light after sort of reading that. So it's it, yeah, really interesting yeah. point. I mean, that. honestly, it's 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 a bit bleak. I mean, you, I read because I'm in Canada. I hear the percentage of Americans who are who don't believe, basically don't believe in science. You know, just think it's fake news or whatever. And it's big. It's like thirty or forty percent think that the theory of evolution is probably not true. <laughs> A bizarre number of people believe in the flat earth theory. I mean, it's really extraordinary. And it's not just yeah, the States. I mean, it's probably not quite as extreme, but those people live in Canada and Australia and South Africa and England as well. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's Michael, crazy. you mean the world's not flat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's no, so funny. Um, so anyway, <laughs> let's move on a, a little bit. So you, you obviously, like I said, you now you live in Canada. You're there with your wife, and you've been there for a number of years now. Yeah. And you you set up your business, uh, Box of Crayons. Can you just tell us a little bit about uh, what Box of Crayons does? Sure. And yeah. Yeah, we're so we're a training company, and our stand is. We think coaching is the essential leadership skill. So we promote, we're champions for coaching as a force for manager excellence and leadership development and culture change within organizations. So we're really trying to make coaching feel like a everyday, unweird, usable leadership behavior that makes people's lives better, both the people who are being the coaches and also the people being coached as well. Yeah, for sure. And, and I can so relate to that, Michael. I was, a, I was an investment banker for almost 20 years. And now I actually work as an executive coach myself. But um, looking back, I'm like, oh, my word, things I, I was like, I was like a manager. And I was like, oh, my God, I was such a useless manager. Right. Um, if only I knew how to coach people it would have been a complete different outcome for all the people that worked underneath me. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's such an important part of it, but it, it's just not done in the business yeah. world. It's not, it's not the only way to lead, but it's a really powerful and effective and significantly underutilized way to lead. And so we're trying to shift the balance of that just a little bit. Mm, for sure. So Michael, in your opinion, you, you kind of touched on it there, Gareth already, but why is it important to have a coach and, maybe who should have a coach? Yeah, so it's worth distinguishing between coaching and helping managers and leaders be more coach-like. So for us, our focus is, and I'll I'll answer your question, but just to say our focus is that we think everybody can be a bit more coach-like in the way they show up to the world. And by more Mm -hmm. coach-like, we mean this. Can you stay curious a little bit longer can you rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly? Mm. And that shift of behavior is something that doesn't matter if you're a big boss leader, middle of the pack, an individual contributor, a brand new employee, showing up in this world, being a bit curious a little bit longer and rushing to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly is a good skill to have. Also, if you're a human being, a parent, you know, a <laughs> a parent or a child, or you just interact with other human beings in your day, that's a good thing to have. So that's our focus. The question about, so who should have a coach? Well, 
you know, in a perfect world, I think you have people in your lives who are supportive in that I'm curious sort of way, rather than I'm telling you what to do sort of way. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a place for advice, don't get me wrong, but it tends to be an overused muscle rather than an underused muscle. And then I think uh, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to have the resources and you have a specific need, Excuse me. Uh, a coach can be a really powerful part of your success team. Let's put it like that. It's a bit kind of new aging. Mm. But, you know, for me, I've had a coach for most of the last 20 years, one way or another, in part because I've had things that I want to achieve. And I just know that it's helpful to have somebody on my side who pushes me when I need to be pushed and encourages me when I need to be encouraged and, helps me face into the hard things I'm trying to avoid and gives me the courage to take on some of the stuff that I probably wouldn't otherwise. And sometimes that's been a formal relationship. So I've paid somebody for a you know, bi-weekly chat, um, mm. you know, similar to what Gareth does. Um, but I also have, for instance, a mastermind group. So we've met for the last probably 10 or 12 years hmm. and we effectively informally coach and support each other. So your, your coach is about somebody who plays a role of championing curiosity, championing you and showing up with that fierce love to say, look, I'm on your side and I want to push you and encourage you to be the best version of yourself. And sometimes that's a paid position and sometimes it's not. Mm. So, so Michael, what, what sort of like coach does a person like you get? Is it a business coach? Is it a personal development coach? What sort of coach yeah. when you do pay for it? Yeah. So you know, with my mastermind trust, and actually when I finish this podcast with you guys, I, I have a, my I, uh, bi-monthly, oh no, so twice a month, bi-weekly conversation with, with them. You know, um, they're more, they started off around business issues because we were all kind of similarly placed in the business that we were running 12 years ago. But really over time, it's become much more about leadership in terms of how are you showing up in your life, how you how are you being the person you want to be? Mm. And uh, the business stuff is secondary to that. Um, my actual business coach, who I've had for 13 years now, hmm. Ernest, he, he's much more of a kind of sounding board, uh, helping me figure out hard decisions for Box of Crayons, you know, money decisions, people decisions, strategy decisions. Um, so he, he helps me with, everything from the big, the big picture vision that I'm trying to hold. So sometimes it's like, how do I have this negotiation conversation with this person? Yeah. It's so important. It's, I think like, sorry, Craig. No, no. Make your own. You know, I think it's so important for people to realize that you do need to sort of spend a bit of money on this to improve yourself. You know, even the top people in the world, you know, you have uh, uh, Federer and whoever it is in what, whatever like industry or sports, whatever, they all have coaches because they need either that sounding board or that little right. bit of, you know, just someone else to give them a different yeah. perspective. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's I mean, one of the things that I think is true about coaching is it is in the narrow, in a narrow sense, a bit of a privileged experience. I mean, it's coaching is from what I can tell very white, very middle class, very, maybe that's it, white middle class. And, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it requires a degree of money to be able to afford somebody. It's not cheap to hire Gareth. It's not cheap to hire me if you're hiring me as a coach. Um, and it just requires a mindset that says, I'm important enough to invest in myself to get what I want. So, uh, while I don't disagree with what you're saying, I do just think you're like, so how do we find coaching resources for people who might not otherwise feel that they have that, that right to claim, mm. to claim a coach? How do we be more coach like to each other? Mm. And is this, is this how or where a mentor might fit in or something like that? Yeah, maybe. I mean, people, people have that conversation. What's the difference between a coach and a mentor? And, you know, uh, sometimes it's that the mentors had experience doing the thing that you're doing. But I always think that a, 
a good mentor is always going to use good coaching skills to, to be a more effective mentor. Because if all the mentor is doing is going, well, let me tell you how I did it in my day, yeah. that's actually not that effective a relationship. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, it's like, it doesn't really matter what label you put on it, but find somebody who will champion you, support you, push you, provoke you, be on your side, but not let you off the hook. And then you've got something that's like having a coach. For sure. For sure. So, uh, Michael, we, uh, we also ask some of our listeners if they've uh, got a question for our current, um, current guests. And this one's an interesting one, actually, because the guy who asked the question, his name is Michael O'Brien, and um, he actually runs a, a business called the Paceline Leadership Academy. And they are profiling your book this month, and you're actually joining them on a call Right, uh, exactly. as well soon so so it's really cool and he's actually a coach and stuff himself but his question was or is is there are many books on how to be a great coach but an, but not enough leaders are great coaches yeah why is there such a gap because um well it's a complex answer to that there's structural issues, which is um, most organizations don't reward people for being great coaches. They reward people for getting stuff done. And sometimes being a great coach isn't the most direct route for getting stuff done. And, and in business, the, the most direct route will win. There's also just um, the insight that being more coach-like sounds easy enough because if you define it like this, how do you stay curious a little bit longer? How do you rush to action and advice a little bit more slowly? You think, well, how hard is that? It's just being curious a bit longer. I could do that. But actually being curious a bit longer um, plays into issues around power and control and status. Because when you're the person who is the one with the answer, the one with the solution, the one with the decision, it's very self rewarding. I mean, literally you get little hits of positive chemicals in the brain going, oh, this is awesome. I'm, I'm the big top dog. I've got the idea. I'm the important person here. And when you move to being more coach, like you embrace this idea of servant leadership and the servant leadership pieces around, how do I make sure that my people finish off better than when they started? And I'm willing to put aside my, let's call it more egotistical needs for their success. And that's actually what coach, being more coach-like is, is about because when you stay curious a bit longer, you give up certainty, you give up control of the conversation, you give up status in the relationship, you give up certainty. And these are all things that your brain craves at a very fundamental, unconscious, kind of lizard brain level. And so you know, it, it, there's structural issues which organizations don't reward people for being more coach-like. There's hab habitual reasons, which is people have been rewarded their entire life for having the answer. So why would they stop having the answer now? And then there's kind of biological reasons, which is we're wired to actually mm. be less curious because we love certainty. It's fascinating. Gareth and I, it's funny, we've, we've spoken about this a lot lately. The, the more we feel like we learn and, about people and subjects and things in life, the, the more humble we are trying to become because you realize how little you know and you don't know what someone else has been through or going through. Or, and and I, I couldn't agree more with you with that whole um, learning to pocket your ego a little bit and say, I don't know sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and, and there's so much power in that, um, that you, or, but or you even, can still have a certain, yeah. when you do know, you still let the other person finish the, yeah. finish, have, have the, make the decision. You know, I saw Alan Mulally speak a while back and he's the former CEO of Ford. And, you know, his key lesson I took from that conversation was, it's as as a senior leader it's never your job to have the answer it's your job is to allow the other people to have the answer even when you have the answer your job is not to have the answer hmm. love that very powerful yeah. so michael you've um written a number of amazing books um with one of them which stands out for you is, is 
the one called In Middle Area, where you actually managed to raise over four hundred thousand dollars for malaria uh, for uh, Malaria No More Foundation. Right. Um, where does your interest and passion uh, in helping malaria come from? You know, it, uh, it's a good question because I'm not actually inherently that interested in malaria or solving malaria. The, the, where that book came from is in, in 2010, I published a book called Do More Great Work. And it basically says, look, three buckets in this world. There's bad work, good work, and great work. You want to be doing a bit more great work and great work is the work that has more impact and the work that has more meaning and you best get to that by articulating a great work project to say this is what i'm going to focus on so i haven't got that book out until i was like i should i should have a great work project so i don't just talk about it but i actually do it mm. and so i went to my local coffee shop and i went okay so what do i what can i do and what do i want to, what impact do i want to have in this world and I was like, okay, I want to dream at a level of making a, a global impact in some way or another. So, you know, dream big here. And what am I good at? Well, I'm good at books and writing books, and I'm good at having weak connections with people, by which means I know a lot of people, although I don't know many people well. And so I had this idea that we'd, we'd write a book that could raise money. And I get people to contribute their, their essays and we'd sell the book and we would take the profit from the book and we put it towards something. But then it's like, but what, what do you put it towards? So I went and I researched the uh, UN's millennial goals. And I basically figured out that the cheapest unit of global change is 10 bucks because 10 bucks buys a mosquito net. Mm -hmm. So my thought for the book originally was buy a book, buy a net. And we make sure that 10 bucks from every book went towards a charity. Um, I ended up doing that in conjunction with Seth Godin. And we effectively found a way of putting all the money, 100% uh, of the ebook money and a little over 95% of the printed books money to Malaria No More. So it was mm. probably closer to two nets per book that we ended up um, generating. Wow. That's amazing. That's incredible. It's actually interesting because um, Sam Harris, who obviously I'm sure you've heard of, his, yeah. his um, sort of uh, he he also spoke about you know doing good in the world and and he needs to then show up for that, and he actually just has a sort of a direct debit from the people supporting his show that goes exactly to that. Like support, that's like the easiest way to create actual saving lives is the mosquito nets in, uh, in sort of some African countries. Yeah, so it's right. really fascinating that you say that. And, uh, but yeah, well done. That's an amazing thing to, Thank you. to contribute yeah, to the I'm world. Yeah, I'm really proud of it. It was a great project. Yeah. And, and I think malaria is like, well, was at least the number one killer in Africa at, at some point. So it's, a, right. it's a huge yeah, deal. I mean, they're, make, they're making great strides to eliminating it with a combination of nets and drugs and mm. fancy stuff like putting neutralize mosquitoes out so that when mosquitoes breed they don't actually lay lay eggs so progress is being made for sure but there's still work to be done mm, definitely yeah. so michael how did you get in touch with say seth godin are you guys already friends because you're in the same circles or you just, just you know i emailed him and uh and I emailed him. I'd been in touch with him a few times. He, he wrote a blurb for a, a book that I wrote. And then I just stayed in touch just every now and then I'd ping him something to say hi or well done or nice to be in touch. So, you know, almost all of the you know, famous people I know, um, yeah, some of them I met through introductions, but most of them I met through just reaching out going, Hey, this is who I am. This is what I've got to offer you. Are you interested in this? And there's often, you know, being on my podcast or something, there's often something in it for them and all of that. Yeah. I think that's a very important lesson for like anybody you've got to, mm -hmm. you know, if you want, if you want somebody on your show, you've got to give them something first. And then at the same time, you've got to nurture that relationship and you've got to be patient. You know, just yeah. these, these are really people busy, they're really yeah. busy people. They're really important. Yeah. And yeah. And when you get, when you get a no, which you do from 40% of the people, it's not mm -hmm. really personal. It's just that they can't say yes to you now for whatever reason. Exactly. Uh, you know, I've, um, 
there's a whole bunch of people who I've reached out to who I've never heard back from. Um, I'm trying to get in touch with a certain writer at the moment and I'm trying my third person to go, can you make a warm introduction to me? And nice. that may or may not work. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it takes a bit of effort. Yeah. I think the what's in it for you or what's in it for them or however you want to phrase it is, a, is also not just obvious. That's, that's just a great life lesson, isn't it? So yeah. If you can just live your life in a way of like, well, how can I first give you something before I yeah. take something? It's just a great way to live. And, and sometimes it's just um, somehow finding a way of balancing the exchange. I mean, one of the one of the things that makes my heart sink a little bit is when I get emails from people going, "Hey, I'm blah blah blah. Can I take you out for a coffee and pick your brain for an hour?" I'm like, <laughs> first of all. That just that just does not sound that great to me. I, you know, having somebody picking my brain, <laughs> I'm like, I'm, it's just not that. That's not that compelling. And you know, no. to to buy me a four buck cup of coffee for, for an hour <laughs> of my time is is below my going rate. <laughs> I'm to do that. So I'm like, so how do you make this a conversation that sounds interesting and compelling to me? It's like can I take 10 minutes of your time on a phone call? I've got two questions I want to ask you that I'm much more likely to say yes to. Yeah, for sure. Cool. And, um, so talking about lessons and things like that, um, you, you've obviously, you know, you, you written your, your last book, which was a huge success. What inspired you to write the coaching habit? Was it like, books you had read or people that you listened to and there's obviously seven essential questions in there yeah. I was just wondering if there's any of those questions have changed or if there's any new ones since you wrote the book um no you know I, I've kind of decided to stick to the seven questions and go there are obviously a lot more questions in the world than just seven but I figure that those are the best seven that I could curate to go I can make a good case for all of them, both individually and as a, as a system at the same time. Um, and as for what prompted me to write it, you know, it's, you know, I, I run a business box of crayons and this part of it is going, I know a successful book or even a kind of unsuccessful book can be a useful marketing tool. So I had a really clear idea that even if this book did not take off in the world, it would be helpful for my business. So there was a mitigated risk in all of this. Um, at the same time, I just also had something to say about coaching, which I thought I can show how coaching can feel less weird, more normal, more practical. I can give people really helpful, practical ways to um, make coaching feel accessible to them. And so... Uh, you know, I wrote I wrote a, a whole bunch of bad versions of the coaching habit before the good version showed up in the world, but I had enough to kind of drive me through to get me to, to write that thing. Mm. I would imagine by you sitting down and doing the exercise of like, you know, scrutinizing and, and again and again and again, you, you like hyper refining your actual yeah. own thoughts in that process anyway. So, so it's always going to be a valuable thing to do. It, it is. I mean, it's a partly why it was a successful book is that it's really tight, really lean, really elegant. And that's because I just wrote it a lot. Um, mm. So there's definitely a, a benefit to it. It was painful going through it though at the time. <laughs> yeah. So Mark, you, you obviously a moment ago, you actually spoke about, you know, the three buckets and one of them being doing more great work. Yeah. What does that actually mean? So the three buckets, bad work is mind numbing, soul sucking, boring, tedious work. Most people know what I'm talking about when I say that. Good work is your job description. So it's productive, efficient, getting things done. And great work is the work that has more impact and the work that has more meaning. So it has both of those things, kind of the external thing and the internal thing, the productivity and the impact and the engagement and the speaking to who you are in this world. And so what you're looking for is more great work, more work that makes a difference, but also speaks to who you are and what your values are and what you care about. And talking about great work, um, 
I guess there's a lot of inspiration around great work, but for you personally, what inspires you these days to, I guess, do more great work and wake up every single morning? Yeah, well, I, I mean, the generic broad answer to that is I'd like to have a good life where I do my best and make a difference in this world and feel like I'm contributing beyond, beyond just my own personal needs. So that's the broad driver for great work is I want to have a life that makes a bit of a difference in the world. Um, and then, of course, my great work changes as my life evolves. And what likes my values don't change much. So what lights me up is going to be similar in many ways. But what the actual great work project is will change depending on where I am and what I'm working on and what shows up. So, you know, my great work project at the moment is, well, trying to write this new book is a big one of them. And um, trying to figure out how to run Box of Crayons is, is another one because I'm the CEO of a company that's bigger than I ever thought it would be. So I've got to go, how do I do this in a way that makes it an awesome place to work and makes us a champion for coaching skills around the world? Mm. Cool. Do you, in your in Box of Crayons, do, do you have, um, you mentioned it earlier, like, is there the structural thing where you, you're the boss, but everyone's kind of coaching and everyone's asking each other questions. I could just imagine you can sometimes get into like a right. sort of an interesting sort of conversation with, with a bunch of coaches. <laughs> well, you know, we, we definitely use the questions internally to, to shape what we're doing. You know, what's on your mind? What's the real challenge here for you? What was you feel about this? So that's that. These are definitely tools that we use, but you know, for us, we're just trying to make sure that coaching is one of those leadership skills that we use. So mm. we, we, you know, we do our best to practice a little bit of what we preach, for sure. Mm, cool. For sure. So, geez, uh, Michael, this has been an amazing chat, and uh, we could literally you know, chat to you for hours, but uh, due to... I, I couldn't. Um, I fall asleep. 100%. We're boring, right? So it must be our voices, but it's our soothing, uh, soothing South African voices. You know? um, but, uh, you know, we, uh, before we just finish off, we'd love to know, like, um, you know, your current projects, you mentioned your book. Are there any other things that you're working on? And also, uh, where can people contact you? Thanks. So, um, that, that's the main thing I'm working on. I mean, part of the discipline of great work is you make your choice and you focus on it. So, if people have too many great work projects, they have no great work projects because you just can't do too many of that. And then in terms of where people might want to find me, so um, the corporate website is boxofcrayons.com. So that tells you mostly about what the training we sell to organizations. Um, I'm going to say that the best place to go to kind of, you know, hook into my mailing list in life is michaelbungaystania.com. Um, so that's my full name, michaelbungaysenior.com. And then, uh, you know, you can find me on Twitter under Box of Crayons. Um, that's probably it, I think. Yeah, but I, I would go to michaelbungaysenior.com. There's a free download of some sort there, and you can just download that, get on my mailing list, and there's a way of connecting. Beautiful. Cool. That's awesome stuff. And uh, Michael, we'd just like to end off with uh, one last question. Sure. And uh, we'd just like to find out, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? that's a good question um I'm, i've got an answer but let me ask you this what's the best answer you've ever had to that oh wow <laughs> i don't know it's so different <laughs> well we don't want to tell you because you know we want uh, we want, in, we want yours to be the best <laughs> but the best answers for us are i have generally been ones where people have just come from a like real honest place and you can just tell it's just been like, you know, what's really is, is honest, not, not necessarily what we want to hear kind of thing, but just one that's come from this real honest place. And I think, yeah, those are the kinds of answers that yeah. are the best. Well, what it means to me is, um, so I tend to think of our human existence of being this very brief point of light with a vast amount of black going in that direction and a vast amount of black going in this direction. So you have, you, we don't have a whole lot of time here. You know, our, our existence in this world is so microcosmically insignificant that it would be a shame not to make the most of it without a sense of play and 
joy and and for me the word ridiculous has less a mocking tone and more a playful celebratory tone um so that's what it would mean to me mm, that's great best answer yeah. ever yeah <laughs> total of best by far <laughs> i don't believe that for a moment but okay. <laughs> oh classic so <laughs> Michael, just wanted to finish off and just say a massive thank you. Seriously, thanks so much for coming on the show. Like we said, we've had this booked in the diary for ages. Having a person like you on our show just means the absolute world to us. It's a privilege and an honor. And, and the, the most cool thing is, is like, you're just such a normal guy. You're so authentic. You're funny. You're charismatic. Um, you, you speak from the heart. Uh, you like to have a joke. And... That's, I think, what is so important. And like you said, you know, it's about being playful, being ridiculously human. And um, I also really liked how you said just to bring things down as a person, you know, to balance things out. If you're yeah. someone who's uh, possibly like, look, you know, is higher in the hierarchy of things. And there was like a really, uh, yeah, just a, a cool thing to say. And, and, and just, I remember that a lot. Um, but it was just great chatting to you. You're a, you're a superman. We just wish you uh, all the best for everything in the future. And uh, yeah, it's been great chatting to you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great to have both of you talking to me. Thank you very much. Great. And just real briefly from my side, Michael, just once again, I just want to echo what Gareth said. Um, there's so much value in this conversation, a lot between the lines, and uh, you are inspiring a lot of other people. So keep it up and good luck with uh, the new writing. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Craig. Right. <laughs> cool waking at dawn packing the gear September tour and up in the air stop at the toll digging for change snow 